All right. Hello, all. I am back. Um, so this is Rearing Rambles, Episode 6, Ode to Odontomantis. Before I get started, I wanted to um, just um, give people a few updates. So I um, took a break from Rearing Rambles just because the end of the semester got really hectic and I was really busy. And so I apologize for the... Uh, pause in that, um, but I'd like to get back to it, um, so I'm gonna do that. Um, it's gonna be, again, um, videos published every, um, Friday at 10 a.m. Uh, Mountain Standard Time, and, um, because of my upcoming work schedule, there may be a few, uh, weeks where there isn't a podcast. What I'm going to probably do, um, in the coming weeks is pre-record several weeks worth of podcasts and then have them week after week publish. Um, I got a really interesting field position, um, but because of that, I will be, um, absent for, um, well, I should say I'll be away from, um, probably, uh, Wi-Fi and internet and, uh, cellular service for quite some time. So don't be alarmed if I disappear. Um, that's just part of what I'm up to. So anyway, let's talk about a small green mantis that has a very unique, um, behavior and adaptation. So does anybody know what, um, Formicophacy is? Formicophacy is ant mimicry, and we see it across taxa in the animal kingdom, especially in certain types of spiders, mantises, phasmids, and um, flies. It's ant mimicry. The animal looks like an ant. Now, why might that be? Well, it's simple. It's because ants are not pleasant. They're not good food sources for predators. They're full of formic acid, and they're generally nasty. They sting, they bite, they come in large numbers that can do the same things. Um, and so a lot of things avoid ants because ants are predatory. In general, there are some herbivorous ants, but generally ants are predatory and ants are problematic for a lot of animals. So animals avoid eating ants for the most part. There are some specialist animals that are predators on only ants. Um, such as the horny toad, it is a, um, reptile species native to, um, I believe the Sonoran Desert around here, uh, and, um, it specializes in eating, um, ants, like harvester ants. But, aside from those couple of species that, uh, really like to eat ants, most things don't like to eat ants. So by mimicking an ant, your risk of being attacked by a predator is lowered. Now, Odontomantis is one member of the Hymenopodidae, or the flower mantis family, that is very good at pharmacophacy. Now, a lot of Hymenopodids, Acanthopids, and um, some other uh, related families practice pharmacophacy during their first and sometimes second instars. Odontomantis, on the other hand, practice this um, adaptation throughout most of their nymphal stage, all the way up until the subadult stage, at which point you can start to see some green and um, even red on their bodies, aside from their typical jet black. They also hold their abdomen straight out instead of curled above the head, um, which assists in that particular um, mimicry. Now, I'll talk a little bit about my fascination with Odontomantis, because Odontomantis has not been a um, very historically popular mantis to rear. So when I was a kid, when I was in, I don't know, sixth and seventh grade, I became aware of Odontomantis. Um, it was mostly Odontomantis montana and planiceps that were kept in culture. Um, Odontomantis is a genus with about 30 some odd species um, throughout Southeast Asia, probably some in uh, like Indonesia and those areas. And these mantises are um, very charming. Um, they're about an inch long. The males are slightly smaller. Um, and they're this spectacular evergreen color. The uh, 
abdomen has a little bit of white and yellow on it. They have um, a little bit of a different color on the sides of the wings. Um, they're very cute and they're very cool. Now, there were a bunch of people who were working with Odontomantis back when I was in a sixth and seventh grade, and so I obtained a couple of pairs of Odontomantis adults. Um, but I had some problems getting the nymphs when they hatched to feed, and so they all died. Now, it was kind of upsetting, and I didn't really know where I went wrong. And um, then Odontomantis kind of disappeared from the hobby. I had not seen anybody keeping Odontomantis for literally a decade. So then, 2021 comes around. Um, so this was, yeah, about a decade later when some people in Europe had received the ooths of Odontomantis mycans from Asia. And so I bought a few. They were shipped to me, they came to me in Rhode Island, and they hatched just fine. Now, being in Rhode Island, I decided I was going to keep them in large net cages with some fake plants, some paper towels at the bottom, yada yada. And they did surprisingly well. They um, had very low mortality. They became adults pr pretty quickly, you know, about three months nymphal stage. And they bred, and soon I had even more nymphs. Then, in the middle of all this, I moved to Colorado. Now, Colorado is a lot drier than uh, Rhode Island. And because of that, I didn't know if net cages would be suitable for my odontomantis. So I started keeping them in small groups in cups, deli cups. And I think this is where I went wrong, because they all but languished. Very, very quickly, I lost all of the news. And I was a bit confused because I thought I was doing everything right and I hadn't yet put together that maybe back in Rhode Island um, the reason they did so well in the net cages was because they were in net cages. Now, I thought, you know, maybe, um, you know, it just happened to work out there because of the humidity level, this and that. So, I did some thinking, and I obtained some more Odontomantis, because a few other people in the U.S. had them still. And um, what I found is that when I rear them in groups, now, they can be groups of 50 in net cages, you know, one foot cube net cages, and they do just fine. The majority of them survive to adulthood, and they breed out of control, females are laying two oods a week, you know, the oods hatch a month later, you know, 30 some odd nymphs come out. Um, they don't like being in cups. Now, I think it's a spacing issue. If you have ever watched Odontomantis, they are active, they are neurotic, they like to dart around, they like to chase their prey, they like to move, they don't like being cramped and confined in my experience. I've heard people tell me they've raised them individually in cups without problems, but even those people are using comically large cups compared to the mantis's size. Remember, they are maybe an inch as adults. I would use a 9 to 12 ounce cup for a mantis that small, generally. But because of how active Odonta mantis is, you probably should be using a 32 ounce cup, not a 9 ounce cup. They need a lot more wandering room for their size. Okay. So, let's see. This species, or this genus, is a very uh, interesting genus. The um, adult females, especially, can live six to eight months into adulthood. And a lot of people have this conception that uh, the bigger the mantis, the longer its lifespan is. Now what I'll tell you is that this isn't exactly true. Automantis and Odontomantis are very, very small species, or genera, um, rather, where the adults are maybe an inch in length. Yet, their adults can live well over 
five, six, even seven months. I've seen Scatidra, Automantis Scatidra females last well into a year as adult. Um, and I've seen big species like Polyspilata live just a few months into adulthood. Um, Polyspilata aeruginosa, the uh, adult females live about six months and the males about four. Um, and then of course you have like the Phylocrania, which is a medium-sized species that the males live five weeks as adults and the females live over a year as adults. But, you know, um, that general pattern of um, small species live short lifespans than large species isn't always true. Um, I don't know how reliable of a pattern that actually is. But I digress. The Odontomantis females can live quite a while. Uh, males, not as much. The males are very cute, very diminutive. They don't eat all that much as adults. They dart around mating with the females. Matings are very short, you know, 20 minutes maybe. Females lay a lot of eggs. Um, very fecund species. Um, I have a lot of them incubating right now, and I have a lot of hatchlings, a lot of subadult and adult from my adult females who are still alive. Um, we're three generations in, in Colorado here. Um, and so now I'd like to talk a little bit about um, what I want to do with Odontomantis. So I have a couple of ideas. My first idea is that the Odontomantis aren't doing particularly well in the net cages because of it being a net cage, but because it's spacious. So I'm going to take a, an equal sized plastic bin that has some ventilation at the top and put a bunch of hatchlings in that and see how they do. Now it won't be a formal experiment because it won't have the replication, but it's just me playing around. I suspect that it's a spacing issue rather than an airflow issue because this is a species that likes it pretty humid. They drink a lot of water when you mist them and they don't do well in dry. So I suspect that a um, bin that's very large will do very well for these. I also suspect this is a good terrarium mantis. For whatever reason, there are people who want to keep their mantises in terraria. Now, a terrarium sounds like a good idea, but it's not always the best idea for a few reasons. The first reasoning is that um, terraria tend to be very stuffy. They tend to hold a lot of air and there's not a lot of fresh air movement in an air exchange. Unless it's a highly ventilated terrarium, at which point it's not really a terrarium anymore, um, you're going to have issues if you have this big glass tank that's loaded with wet soil and live plants. Even if the entire top is a screen top, you're still not getting the kind of air movement that a mantis might need. Remember that out in nature, even in very humid environments, there's a lot more airflow than what you're ever going to get indoors. This is one of those things that doesn't occur to most people. And it's, you know, not really anybody's fault. But what you have to realize is that the dynamics of a large space are going to be a lot different than the, than the dynamics of a small space. This is why also plants outdoors can survive in seemingly gunky, sticky, poorly drained soil, whereas the roots die and rot if they're kept in a pot of nothing but like hummus material. And I don't mean the dipping edible hummus, I mean like the compost hummus. And that's why potting soils have a lot of perlite and other things in them to regulate aeration and stuff like that. The major reasoning for that is because when you have a pot, the surface area to volume ratio of the soil that the plants are inhabiting is very low. So air exchange is going to be stifled. When you add perlite and other particles that don't absorb moisture, you increase that surface area to volume ratio so more air can get in. When you have plants outside in the ground, the surface area to volume ratio is much, much higher because you have maybe a foot of soil that the plants can inhabit across miles and miles and miles of ground cover. Therefore, you get a lot more air permeating into that soil. And that principle also applies to like tropical rainforests and things like that. 
what you what people fail to understand is that the dynamics of an open environment like a tropical rainforest are going to be a lot different than the, than the dynamics of a glass terrarium. Um, you know, I have this conversation a couple times a year with people, um, and um, I've learned to be patient because um, it's not intuitive, um, and it does require some um, applied science. Um, and unfortunately, people aren't taught applied science at a base level. Um, so, you know, I get asked when I work with my orchids, you know, well, you know, it seems like I find these, you know, lady slipper orchids all over the place in the wild, in the ground. Why can't I just put them in my um, garden? Well, what you're seeing in your garden is actual. I mean, in the wild is... A fraction of a percent of how many seeds were actually released into the environment by the parent plants decades ago. You're not necessarily understanding that the odds are stacked against any individual plant, even in the wild, to be able to survive somewhere. So when you're artificially pumping up your numbers of these things, you have to also artificially make that area more suitable for them. When you're dealing with a um, terrarium, you have to realize that if there's no air movement in and out, um, and, you know, let's be pedantic for a moment, of course there's going to be some air movement in and out no matter what, okay? As long as, like, you don't have, like, an airtight seal around the top of the terrarium, there's going to be air movement in and out of that terrarium. But... There is a limit to how much air movement can occur in and out of that terrarium. Partially because there's a limit to how much air movement is occurring inside your house. So what you have to do is you have to account for that. And one way of accounting for that is to use a species of mantis that might be well suited to living in a more stagnant, humid environment. Um, now. Whether or not Odontum mantis is the most aesthetically pleasing mantis is, you know, I beauty's in the eye of the beholder, but from a um, whether or not they can pull it off living in a terrarium perspective, I suspect Odontum mantis mycans will do very well in a terrarium. So I am also doing an experiment where I'm currently making the terrarium so that I can put the Odontum mantis in the terrarium. Um, I'm almost done. I have to plant it and uh, get my uh, self-watering system ready to roll. But once I do that, I'll be able to um, add the odontomatis and see if it works. Um, and so that's going to be exciting. So we're about 20 minutes in. I would like to spend a little bit of time now talking about... Um, Odontomantis and their food preferences and things like that. So, Odontomantis are small but fierce feeders. They hatch out fairly large compared to the adults and will eat Drosophila melanogaster during their first two instars. Then they're transitioned to Drosophila hydei for the next three instars before I start offering them um, house flies. Only the adult females will eat bottle flies. The adult females will also eat small roaches and crickets. Adult males will eat houseflies, and um, they are um, pretty uh, aggressive feeders. They can be kept in groups as long as food stays plentiful. Um, that's how I prefer to keep them in groups, just because each individual will require so much space that if I put them all in a net cage together, I save space over time. Um, they are um, one of those species where the uh, female has an extra instar as nymphs, um, that's not too shocking, but um, I do think that people should be um, rearing odontomantis. I don't get a lot of interest in the odontomantis, unfortunately, but they are a really cool species to work with. Um, odontomantis mycans is what I have right now. Um, and I think that um, odontomantis and anaxarcha, which is a related genus that kind of looks like odontomantis with a more elongate thorax, um, pronotum to be specific. Those are really cool. So, 
bottom line is that Aunt Mantises are really cute, really fun. Um, they are one of just a few species that I really want to keep long term. Um, and so I figured I would talk about them and how much I love them. So um, this has been a short episode of Rearing Rambles, but um, I hope everybody enjoyed.